Herod gets five days of mercy, but then he reaps what he sowed. Hi, I'm David Servant. This is Heavenward TV. Well, it's so good to be together again. Thank you so much for joining me as we continue our chronological study through the entire New Testament. And we're finishing out Acts chapter 12. We've just read about the big fish who got away. And the big fish was Peter. And the guy who was trying to reel him in was Herod. Uh, but uh, the Lord was bigger than Herod and orchestrated a lovely uh, escape plot. And uh, we're going to keep talking about Herod because uh, Luke, the author of Acts, keeps talking a little about Herod to give us really the end of the story. Because Remember, we read at the beginning of the chapter, chapter 12, that Herod, uh, this is Herod Agrippa, had James, the brother of John, executed by a sword, just simply to court favor with the Jews, the unbelieving Jews. So Luke can't resist telling us about what happened ultimately to Herod. Verse number 21 of Acts 12, on an appointed day, oh, let me back up a little bit here just to get the, uh, the context. Um, this is the last sentence of verse number 19. Then he, Herod, went down from Judea to Caesarea and was spending time there. Now he was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and with one accord they came to him, and having won over Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they were asking for peace because their country was, was fed by the king's country. And on an appointed day, Herod, having put on his royal apparel, took his seat on the rostrum and began delivering an address to them. The people kept crying out, the voice of a god and not a man. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give God the glory and he was eaten by worms and died. Now, uh, Luke cites the, the reason that Herod was struck by the angel, obviously at the uh, command of God, was because he didn't give glory to God when the people were crying out the voice of a God and not a man. Um, and that may be the, the whole reason. No doubt that upset God, no, no debating that whatsoever. Was there any uh, you know, weighing of the cumulative sin of, uh, of Herod uh, that led to God's decision to send an angel who would strike uh, Herod dead. Uh, I would tend to think so, uh, but I do find it interesting that at the beginning of the chapter, this same Herod Agrippa had James put to death by execution. One of the, you know, original 12 disciples, a uh, big shot in the church, brother of John, sons of Ze Zebedee, and, and God still has mercy and patience with him all through this incident with Peter. He intends to kill Peter. That's what's in his heart. He's going to execute Peter as well. God lets him live, but... What's the last straw for the Lord when Herod begins taking glory that only belongs to God? And God apparently said, that's enough. And it does show us, I think, on a comparative basis, um, the difference between uh, a sin against man and a sin against God. We don't realize that so much. But again, God let Herod get away with the murder of a, a, a righteous man, the intended murder of another righteous man, but God didn't let him get away with this, not giving God his due glory, keeping glory for himself. Whoa. So that's kind of a sobering thought. Uh, there was a Jewish historian by the name of um, Josephus uh, who wrote a lot of, you know, interesting, the antiquities of the Jews. You've got a book by it. You can buy a copy today. Um, you can read it probably for free on the internet. And he actually cites uh, this exact incident when Herod, uh, at this time in history, when he uh, suffered severe stomach uh, pains, and after five days, he died. Okay, agrees perfectly with what um, we just read in Scripture, um, that an angel of the Lord struck him, and he was eaten by worms and died. But I would like to just point out the fact that if what Josephus wrote was indeed accurate, uh, it shows not only the judgment of God, but the mercy of God. God could have struck Herod dead instantly, but God was patient through Herod's execution of James, Herod's intended execution of, of, of uh, 
uh, Peter, and now he's patient even after uh, Herod takes glory from God, you know, not correcting anyone who says we're hearing the voice of a God. And God was patient with them for five more days, five days of mercy. Why? Why didn't God just snuff them out? Because God's trying to get a message to him, you know, uh, and surely Herod was thinking about it. What did I do to deserve this? And all I had to do was think about, you know, a day or two ago, and uh, then a few weeks before that, and a few weeks before that, and hopefully the guy would repent. And we don't really know if he did or he didn't. I, I kind of think he probably didn't repent. Wouldn't it be a great big surprise to see this Herod Agrippa in heaven praising God, saying, I've been saved by the blood of the Lamb? It was within the realm of possibilities. You have to agree with me there, right? I mean, had Herod Agrippa repented, he could have been forgiven. The Apostle Paul, the guy we're reading about here in Acts, was also a murderer. You know, he, had, he was in hearty agreement with putting Stephen to death, and it's quite clear he persecuted the church, and there were probably people who died as a result of that. He was a murderer. He was forgiven. Herod Agrippa could have been forgiven, too. God gave him five days of mercy. Whoa. i tell you what, that's, that, that's cool, okay? Now, we're just about out of, out of uh, verses here in, in chapter 12. Um, Verse 24, but the word of the Lord continued to grow and be multiplied. I love the late John Stott's commentary on Acts chapter 12. He said it begins with James dead, Peter in prison, and Herod triumphing. And it ends with Herod dead, Peter free, and the word of God triumphing. You know, so whew, a complete 180 there, and God specializes in 180s. Uh, and then the last verse of number uh, of chapter 25, chapter 12, rather, verse 25. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem, so they've gone back to Antioch to keep on ministering to the Gentile church when they had fulfilled their mission, which was to bring that offering, remember that? And, and taking along with them John, who was called Mark. Okay, so that sets the stage now for chapter 13. Of course, Luke didn't write this in chapter and verse, but we're gonna begin reading once again about the, the activity of the Holy Spirit in Antioch and what we, we call today the first missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. All right, that begins in chapter 13, so can't wait to dive into that with you. I'll be right back. Alrighty, welcome back and welcome back to Acts chapter 13. We're actually going to be spending time uh, working our way through Acts 13 and then Acts 14. And it's going to cover a couple of years uh, of history, uh, looking primarily at uh, the early ministry of the Apostle Paul and the first missionary journey. And then we're going to go uh, into the first uh, book that the, Paul penned, uh, which pretty well widely agreed that it was the book of Galatians. You're going to see why he penned the book of uh, Galatians early on, because we're going to travel with him to Galatia. Okay, so stay tuned. Acts chapter 13, verse number 1. Now there were at Antioch, that's the, that's the place of that great Gentile church, in the church that was there, prophets and teachers. I got to stop right there and I got to make, I got to make a comment. Uh, oh, to live back in those days when the church in Antioch didn't consist of, of course, one flock that all came to one mega church every Sunday or some big auditorium, or, you know. No, it consisted of many flocks, of course. Uh, perhaps they came together at times, but they were meeting in houses and, and wherever they could meet in smaller groups. And, um, you know, they, uh, no, perhaps they at times used a larger venue and so forth. We know that Paul taught there for, for a whole year, probably larger crowds than what you can fit into a house. But uh, there was no denominations. There wasn't, you know, uh, lots of church buildings with signs identifying how they were different than those other churches. Because every sign uh, in front of a Christian church uh, that's associated with some denomination and has their denominational tag out there or their affili affiliation, uh, they're sending a message to everyone who drives by their church. Don't confuse us with those Christians. We're not like them, and we don't fellowship with them because we're different, and that's why we have a distinctive name out here. We're part of this group. And I think that is to be regretted, 
And I'm glad that pastors of different denominations these days do get together and tolerate one another to some degree, but I just wish, oh, I wish that all that stuff could just crumble at the feet of Jesus, uh, who prayed that we might be one, even as he is one with the Father. Jesus didn't start multiples, uh, multiple churches, he started one church. And the church that was there in Antioch, there was one church, not 20 or 30 or 40 different denominations. And if they were, as I believe they were, meeting in lots of different places in Antioch, uh, as the, as the, word, of the word of the Lord grew and, 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 and the church multiplied, um, you know, they weren't, they weren't looking at themselves as separate or different from those Christians who meet over there. We're one body, one faith, one Lord, one Christ, one God, one baptism. Amen. All right, in that church, that one church that was there in Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Now, of course, we know there also would have been pastors slash elders slash overseers. Uh, those, fra th those words in the New Testament all you know, are synonymous. But Luke is not pointing out that there were no pastors, elders, overseers. He's just saying that in the church, it also had prophets and teachers, okay? And then he names a few of them, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Menaean, who'd been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. Two of those names I recognize, Barnabas and Saul, at the beginning of the, and the end of that list. So all those men, uh, one, two, three, four, five, were either prophets, teachers, or a combination of a prophet and a teacher. And I say that because it's going to be very interesting. We're going to read about how the Holy Spirit soon sends Saul and Barnabas out on a missionary journey. And we get into Acts chapter 14. They're referred to as apostles. Apostles are sent ones. And so we see that the ministry of Saul and Barnabas, who prior to being sent out by the Holy Spirit were in the category of teacher, or prophet, or teacher and prophet, because, you, you know, two people, one person could have two offices there. Now they've both been promoted or changed, however you want to call it, to the office of apostle, because they're sent out by the Holy Spirit. And that's what apostle means, one who is sent out. While, verse number two, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart from me Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them, end quote. How did the Holy Spirit speak? Well, um, you know, either everybody heard an audible voice, or I think more likely, uh, somebody prophesied. Somebody had the word of the Lord given to them because, goodness, there's five prophets in the church and they're spending time ministering to the Lord, so they're worshiping the Lord and they're fasting. Keep in mind, fasting doesn't have to mean fasting 40 days. It can be fasting one meal, just skipping a meal, but spending some time to seek the Lord. And that, if I could just pause and follow this rabbit trail for a second, is the primary reason for fasting. It's not to, you know, kind of wrench God's arm behind his back to force him to do something because of your, your hunger and make God feel sorry for you. It's so you can have more time to seek the Lord and not be distracted by anything else fully devoted to prayer. Prayer is always combined with fasting. There's no real sense in fasting, from a spiritual standpoint anyways, unless you combine it with prayer or meditation in God's Word. Okay. Also notice here that the, what the Holy Spirit said was not specific instruction. It's rather general. Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. It's specific in that sense. It nails two guys, but it doesn't say you know, exactly what they are to do. Set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them, imp implying that they already knew the work to which they had been called by God. Okay, and that's really important. Why, why am I saying that? I'm saying that because so many folks have been, have been misled by prophecy, whether it's you know, sincere prophecy or insincere prophecy. Someone tells them something that, you know, thus saith the Lord, and uh, they, they, they didn't realize it, but they say, oh, well, the Lord spoke, and so I better do what he said. I always encourage people, if someone gives you a prophecy and uh, you know, a direction, that prophecy, that's going to cost you something, and you don't already know it in your heart, you, know, you haven't already been pondering because the Holy Spirit has you know, already been speaking to you, I would just forget about it. I would just forget about it, okay? And I think that's borne out in what we have just read here, okay? So we get together in the next segment, we're going to talk about exactly what they did next. 
right back. All right, welcome back to Acts chapter 13, the uh, calling, the setting apart, the sending out of Paul, or as he was called here, Saul and Barnabas on the church's first missionary journey. Uh, it all started with, uh, we think, a prophecy or some kind of a word from the Lord that came that said to uh, all of them while they were seeking the Lord and ministering to the Lord and fasting, set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. That's Acts 13 and verse number 2. And I emphasized the last time that it wasn't so specific. It seems apparent that Paul and Barnabas had already been feeling that, you know, leading by the Holy Spirit, we need to go out. And it's going to be interesting as we continue on through our, the book of Acts over the months ahead of us to watch how exactly the Holy Spirit leads and guides. And what I've already said about the Holy Spirit, you know, confirming what what he has already spoke to us, you know, in our hearts, confirming it through prophecy or confirming it through a vision, that turns out to be a scriptural pattern, okay, and one that we should take heed to. Be very careful when someone gives you a prophecy that you are surprised about, okay? But if you're wrestling over something and, and you feel like the Lord's giving you direction on something and you haven't told anybody about it and then somebody, you know, comes up to you and says, the Lord says to you, and again, this person didn't know, they didn't ask you baited questions beforehand, they didn't talk to your pastor and get information about you, I mean, the, the real deal stuff here, real prophecy, real revelation, then, you know, if they confirm what you know, then it's assurance to you. And I have found that if, in fact, God does give you that added extra assurance through some spectacular means of guidance that, that's beyond just the, the inward voice like a prophecy, like a vision, that's because God knows you're going to need the extra assurance that you're in his will because you're, you're heading for trouble. Okay, and you have to fall back on, wait a second, what did the Lord say? I had it in my heart, and the Lord gave a prophecy to somebody who didn't know, and, you know, okay, I'm in God's will as you're, as you're toughing it out there. Okay, so if you don't get any of that kind of spectacular guidance, then be glad in one sense. Okay, so verse number three, then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. No delay. No itinerating, you know, to raise support and so forth. Where God guides, he provides, and off they went. Um, we'll see that, you know, Saul and his band were supported through offerings, uh, offerings through those, you know, in other places and those who were right there where they were ministering. If they'd establish a church, right away those people would start taking care of their needs. Um, and also when they had to, they worked. Paul was, at, you know, made, made tents. Uh, at one time, just to support himself. Okay, so verse number four. Here's an interesting verse. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit. And that's the important thing. You know, you don't want to go unless you're sent by the Holy Spirit. Because if, if you go and you're not sent by the Holy Spirit, you're not in God's will. And he's not going to help you like you hope to be helped. All right? Uh, we really need to, you know, Take time to seek the Lord as they did on decisions such as these. You know, missionaries who say, I'm called, and they go off, and uh, six months later, they're back, you know, having, you know, been unprepared and, uh, you know, really turned upside down and faced hardships they weren't ready for or situations they weren't ready for. You know, it kind of indicates that maybe you didn't hear from the Lord. You went out prematurely. Okay, and again, I've been guilty of being premature on things. God can speak to us things, but he can speak to us things and tell us, well, I'm preparing you now to eventually do thus and so. But don't rush out and do thus and so right now or you're going to be in trouble. That's in your divine destiny. And you got to take it step by step. Uh, I, I, you know, a lot of spiritual people, I've been around spiritual people for 35 years and uh, made of a lot of observations. And some of the most wonderful people, uh, spiritual people I know, have made this mistake, and that is they're in tune with God. I mean, they are devoted, dedicated servants of God, and they, but they get something in their heart that they believe God has spoken to them, and I have no doubt that he has. But it's, it's not to be fulfilled for 
10 years, 15 years, 20 years. It's a, it's a divine destiny. Uh, you know, it's their ultimate goal where God wants them. But they try to step out by faith and step into what God knows they're not ready for uh, you know, until 10 or 15 or 20 years, and they fail. And again, I've been guilty of that myself. Okay, so I'm you know, just preaching to myself here, but I've learned over the years. Maybe I can save you the heartache of doing that, okay? That's one thing to have faith in what God has said for you to do right now. It's another thing to be foolish, trying to do now what God has told you to do in 10 years. Okay, but they're sent out by the Holy Spirit, so off they go. So they, verse number four, so they went down to Seleucia. So that's just a short hop right to the Mediterranean Sea. Of course, Antioch is practically on the Mediterranean Sea, so right down to the port there, Seleucia. And from there, they sailed to Cyprus. Well, that's an island not too, too far off the, off the coast there, the, the uh, eastern coast of the Mediterranean. And when they reached Salamis, which is a city on the eastern side of that island of Cyprus, they began to proclaim the word of God, God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they also had John as their helper. So John, also called Mark, has gone along with them. It's more than just two guys, Saul and Barnabas. It's Saul and Barnabas and John Mark. And when they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they found a magician, a Jewish false prophet whose name was Bar-Jesus. So they've you know, gone across the entire island preaching along the way, no doubt focusing on preaching in the synagogues of the Jews. That was Paul's standard strategy. It makes sense. Uh, God loves Jews. Jesus died for Jews. They've been waiting for a Messiah. They have uh, faith in the Old Testament Scripture. The Old Testament Scripture talks about the Messiah, and so you think it'd be an easier task to win over Jews than Gentiles. Paul didn't always find that to be the case, did he? But to the Jews first, then ultimately to the Gentiles. And they do a transection across the entire island of, uh, of, of uh, Cyprus, and when they're on the far western side, then they run into this guy named Sergius Paulus, uh, excuse me, Bar-Jesus, in verse number seven, who was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus. Well, we're gonna have a cliffhanger here because we're out of time, all right? So, cool story coming up next about Bar-Jesus and the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. See you next time. Visit us online at heavenward.tv to view this and every episode of Heavenward TV for free. Watch the behind the scenes videos. Read other teaching articles, books, and devotionals written by David Servant. And learn about other exciting ministries that David directs. All this and more is at heavenward.tv.